In today's Final Touch, flowers aren't the only thing drawing people to the Green Bay Botanical Gardens this summer. The Nature Connects exhibit has people talking, and here's why. The exhibit features 16 Lego sculptures, all designed by a renowned New York artist who's famous for using Legos to design high-profile pieces. The exhibit travels the country, and it took years to bring the exhibit to Titletown. The exhibit includes a dragonfly, a corn spider, and a peacock. The Lego exhibit will be... Green Bay Botanical Gardens through August, so there's plenty of time to see them. Quite remarkable. Well, that's aren't they? unbelievable because that peacock right I, there. The peacock is just amazing. Oh, Might boy. be worth a trip to Green Bay this summer. Perhaps it will be. All right, that's our time for now. Thanks for watching. News 3 at 5 starts right now. Right now at 5, the former Beloit officer accused of sexually assaulting a child is in court. What the police chief there is saying about the allegations. Plus, a man accused of hiding a body near a Beloit school will not be charged. We'll tell you why not. And two special elections. The state to fill vacant legislative seats. We'll have a live report from Columbia County. This is News Thanks for staying with News 3. Beloit police officers have arrested one of their own, and the retired officer is now facing child sexual assault charges. A judge set a $100,000 signature bond for 62-year-old Larry Woods in Rock County Court today after police arrested him this weekend. Our Rock County reporter Jenna Meadow is live at our bureau at the Janesville Gazette to tell us how the community is reacting. Jenna? Mark and Eric Woods retired from the Beloit Police Department in 2007, but has been working as a security guard for the school district and Beloit Public Library. And people tell me they were shocked to hear the allegations against him. Very, very disturbing. Josette Carpenter lives just a few blocks away from the Beloit Public Library, where 62-year-old Larry Woods has worked part-time since 2012. I just want to know what, where are the background checks? You know, yeah, he was a former police officer, but... But Beloit police arrested him on Saturday after a 14-year-old girl's mom reported he sexually assaulted her daughter. Police say the relationship between Woods and the teen has been going on for about a year. To this point, the investigation is more than an allegation. Besides working at the library, Woods was also a security guard for the Beloit School District after retiring from the police department in 2007 with 25 years of service. When a previously trusted member of the public, the city, law enforcement is involved in allegations of this nature that it does cause a ripple effect in the community. Prompting parents like Josette to remind their kids to stay safe and report anything suspicious. It's just very difficult and just tell him to say no, scream, run, and um, always come home and talk to me about it if anything ever happens. Beloit police say the FBI might get involved because this crime could have crossed state lines, but they say their first concern is seeing if there are any more victims here in Rock County. All right, Jenna Minow reporting live from the Bureau at the Janesville Gazette. Thank you. A former Madison teacher's tell-all blog alleging turmoil inside a local middle school is making the rounds on social media. In it are claims of a mass exodus of students and staff because of an uncaring principal. Coming up on News 3 at 6, our Keeley Arthur will share what's been written and what the district has to say about it. And new tonight, the Rock County District Attorney's Office will not file charges against the main suspect in a drug-related death. Adam Duxter joins us to explain why Corey Sandoval is free tonight. Corey Sandoval was expected to appear here in court today, but the District Attorney's Office says there's not enough evidence to charge him. Sandoval was arrested in May for failure to aid a victim after Dustin Grice's body was found behind Townview Elementary. Police say they believe he died of a drug overdose. Town of Beloit Police Chief Ron Northrup says just because no charges were filed today doesn't mean the case is over. Our investigation is still ongoing. Uh, I'm waiting for the autopsy report. Um, also, um, I know that there are uh, other avenues that we're looking at and there's still people that we need to interview. Police arrested Sandoval about 14 hours after finding Grice's body. The chief says he likely could have been saved if Sandoval or someone else had called for help. Police told us today they will continue to look into the case and might file new charges if they find any new information. In Janesville, Adam Duxter, WISC News 3. All right, let's get a look at your first alert weather chief meteorologist Gary Canalti joining us in the Weather Center. Gary. 
Well, it's pretty humid out there, but we'll see a little break in the humidity over the next couple of days before the heat and humidity really kick in for the weekend. In fact, we have alert days in the forecast for Saturday and Sunday. We boosted the high temperatures up a little bit more to 90 on Saturday and 92 on Sunday. That could be flirting with record high temperature levels. And heat index values now could be as warm as 100 on Saturday and maybe 102 on Sunday. As we take a look at visible cloud track, we've had clouds over southern Wisconsin for much of the day. <coughs> there have been some breaks in the clouds to our west and northwest. And as a cold front moves eastward, it's possible there could be some thunderstorms that start to develop. Nothing out there right now, but the Storm Prediction Center does have a a slight risk of severe thunderstorms to our north and west and a marginal risk from Madison on toward the south and east. It'll be mainly overnight to around midnight to shortly thereafter if a line of storms does develop. Low temperatures this morning started out very mild because of the high humidity and fog. Temperature in Madison dropped only to 65. So far we've been as warm as 78. Again, down a little bit because of the cloud cover. But as we look at current temperatures, they're still in the middle 70s. And dew point temperatures are generally in the middle to upper 60s. So by tomorrow morning, look for temperatures to be down into the uh, middle 60s to around 60 degrees. Showers and thunderstorms most likely overnight. And then look for sunny skies to develop for tomorrow. It'll be less humid with a high temperature of 80. That's your first alert forecast. All right, Gary, thank you. A Wisconsin mother has been charged in the death of her 13-year-old daughter who was an, unable to walk, talk, or care for herself. 37-year-old Nicole Gussert of Appleton faces one count of child neglect, resulting in the death of Brianna Gussert. A criminal complaint says Brianna had infections caused by unsanitary conditions and died primarily of sepsis after her mother left her alone for days during Memorial Day weekend last year. In court, the district attorney says Gussert couldn't remember the last time she had fed her daughter or changed her diaper. The public defender says the charge is simply an allegation and that criminal behavior has not been proven by the state. Gussert is being held on $300,000 cash bond. Lafayette County deputies are investigating after one person was taken to a hospital after a two-vehicle crash. Deputies responded around 5.30 last night with two-vehicle crash with injuries at the intersection of Truman Road and Bethel Grove Road in Kendall Township. Deputies say 50-year-old Tamara Halverson of Gratiot was driving east when 51-year-old Timothy Meyer of Cuba City failed to yield the right of way and pulled forward into that intersection, hitting Halverson's vehicle on the driver's side. Halverson was trapped in the vehicle and had to be extricated. She was eventually taken to UW Hospital via med flight. Meyer refused medical treatment. A 35-year-old Janesville man faces his fourth drunken driving charge after being stopped early this morning for a defective brake light. Janesville police say an officer stopped Jeremiah Jensen just before 3 a.m. near the intersection of Center Avenue and State Street. Jensen showed signs of intoxication and then during field sobriety tests, he showed signs of impairment, the officers said. Voters from several counties in our area will have the chance to elect their next state lawmaker today. Governor Walker called two special elections to fill open seats, one in the northeastern part of the state and the other covering most of Columbia County and parts of surrounding counties. Rose Schmidt is live in Lodi to tell us about the candidates from the 42nd Assembly District. Rose? That's right, Democrat Ann Groves Lloyd and Republican John Plummer both live here in Lodi. And the city clerk here tells me that voter turnout is actually higher than usual for this type of race. Groves Lloyd says that the issues she's most passionate about are health care and protecting the environment. Plummer told me fixing Wisconsin roads is one of his top priorities, along with property and income taxes. Dean Rubenstein of Partyville is running as an independent in this race. The Lodi, Lodi, excuse me, Lodi City Clerk has seen a steady stream of voters and says there's been a large amount of publicity for this race from radio and TV ads to signs. Now the polls are open until 8 o'clock tonight and coming up on News 3 at 6, we will hear from some voters in this area about why they chose to cast their ballot today. All right, Rose Schmidt reporting live for us from Lodi. Thank you, Rose. A new drone ordinance may change the way you use your drone within the Madison City limits. New legislation passed in April says local governments must follow the rules of the state. The ordinance proposed by the Madison City Council mirrors state law, meaning if you violate the law, you could see some steep fines. Misuse can be anything from using a drone to invade someone's privacy, which is a $500 fine, unlawful flying and or landing of an aircraft, a $750 fine. Using the drone as a weapon can bring fines to $2,000. Some argue city officials still wouldn't have the authority to issue citations. The proposal will be brought forward at the public safety meeting tomorrow. A Florida fifth grader who wants to honor police officers around the country by buying them donuts. Ten-year-old Tyler Karach, also known as Donut Boy, is visiting departments around 
around the country to thank officers for serving their communities. He's delivered more than 65,000 donuts to officers so far in more than 30 states. He'll be bringing a total of 20 dozen donuts to the Madison and McFarland Police Departments today. Police have to risk their lives every single day when they put on their uniform. So I want to thank them for their sacrifices. He says his goal is to personally deliver a donut to every one of the 900,000 officers in this country. Tyler says he wants to become an officer himself when he gets older. Four falcon chicks that hatched last month now have names. Babcock, Neutrino, Crazy Legs, and Barry. Don't just describe ice cream produced at UW-Madison's dairy plant, but also are the names of four peregrine falcon chicks that hatched last month at the Blunt Generating Station. Madison Gas and Electric announced those names today. Babcock was named after the famed UW-Madison food scientist who developed the first test that successfully determined the fat content of milk. Neutrino, Crazy Legs, and Berry were named after three flavors of ice cream produced there. MG&E said they have seen 39 of those peregrine falcons hatch at the Blount Station since 2009. It's a very successful program. Yeah, crazy legs. Crazy legs. Right <laughs> well, a retiring Lafayette County K-9 officer has found a new home. K-9 Cody is retiring from the department. Cody had served Lafayette County since 2009. He's the second officer the department has had since it started 16 years ago. Department leaders say Cody has been dealing with some health issues this past year. The department posted this morning that Cody was in need of a new home. Just hours later, they told News 3, that Cody has been spoken for. Enjoy retirement. Look at that face. Well deserved. <laughs> Coming up on News 3 at 5, how students across the nation are remembering the victims of the Pulse nightclub shooting two years later. And the president is now on his way home after a historic meeting with Kim Jong-un. What lawmakers are saying about the meeting. And on Wall Street on this Tuesday, the Dow off about a point and a half. The Nasdaq did add 44. The S&P up about five. We'll be right back.
A federal judge ruled today that AT&T can move forward with its $85 billion acquisition of Time Warner. Judge Richard Leon of the U.S. District Court for the for the District Court of the District of Columbia said in a hearing that he has found after a six-week trial that the deal does not violate antitrust law and can proceed. The judge's ruling will likely be seen by tech and telecom giants as a green light to pursue a slew of major media acquisitions. Groups of students across the country are marking the second anniversary now. The Pulse nightclub shooting in Orlando with so-called die-in demonstrations to protest gun violence. Students placed roses on the ground in front of the U.S. Capitol as the names of the 49 victims of the Pulse nightclub shooting were read aloud. Afterwards, the activists staged a die-in on the Capitol lawn to call for stricter gun laws. Organizers made the die-in last 12 minutes long, or more than 700 seconds. They say that's about one second for each of the mass shootings in the U.S. that resulted in four injuries since the Pulse attack. It's really disgusting, I think, that Congress has not done much to change the situation or the scenario. In Orlando, a uh, bell tolled 49 times for the Pulse victims as family members placed rainbow-colored pinwheels in their memory. President Trump now on his way home from Singapore where he agreed to a deal with North Korean leader Kim Jong-un to begin the process of denuclearizing the Korean Peninsula. President Trump and the North Korean dictator have signed an agreement to begin that process. Lawmakers on Capitol Hill are cautiously hopeful. Just the beginning. Yeah, it's just... It's kind of an agreement to continue talking, and which I said earlier, as long as you're talking, you're not fighting, and that's a good thing. It's a welcome improvement to see the two of them having a dialogue rather than engaging in name-calling and saber-rattling. When the U.S. and North Korea say they will continue that dialogue, the North Koreans also agree to return the remains of American service members lost in North Korea during the Korean War. A fast-moving wildfire in Summit County, Colorado, has forced people to leave their homes. The fire began burning on Buffalo Mountain east of Silverthorne early this morning. Officials say the fire's already burned 100 acres. Officials are working to rescue people who do not have transportation out of the area. There's no word on what caused the fire uh, what caused this wildfire. The nation's capital celebrating today after the Washington Capitals won the Stanley Cup. The Caps and their fans celebrated their championship with a parade today. It was the hockey team's first ever cup. The parade wound through downtown, ended in a rally along the National Mall. I love these guys. Uh, we're all family now forever, along with you guys. And everybody says what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. But we brought the cup home! <laughs> the Capitals beat the Las Vegas Golden Knights four games to one to win the Stanley Cup. Meanwhile, celebrations are underway in Oakland, California for the Golden State Warriors. The Warriors swept the Cleveland Cavaliers to take their second consecutive NBA championship. It was the third time in four years Warriors fans have been treated to an NBA title victory celebration and parade. Giant TV screens were placed along the parade route and Warriors employees strolled along the street carrying microphones, allowing fans to ask the players questions as they <laughs> rolled by. Oakland officials said they they expected as many as one million fans to line the streets. We'll go to the backyard patio now. Gary Canalti with the very latest on our forecast and Humidity's on the way, but not quite here yet, Gary. Well, no, it's here right now. Is We're going to take a break the next couple of days oh. and then have it come going. back even more for okay. the weekend. So I'm not paying attention, Gary. <laughs> <laughs> Should I send you a copy of my forecast before I come out here? No, it's, it is pretty humid out here right now. The question is whether or not we'll see thunderstorms. Let's start out by taking a look at uh, alert days that we have in the forecast. This is for the real heat and humidity. If you think it's humid now, wait till the weekend. Dew point temperatures will be in the 70s. Overnight, low temperatures will be around 70. And daytime high temperatures should be around 90 on Saturday and around 92 on Sunday. That'll push heat index values up around 100 degrees or maybe even a little bit above that. So alert days in the forecast for both Saturday and Sunday. Now, invisible cloud track, we've got a lot of humidity here and a lot of clouds over southern Wisconsin, but you can see some breaks occurring to our north and west. The question is whether or not thunderstorms will develop there. Well, first of all, we take a look at the temperatures. They're in the 70s, in Twin Cities right now at 80, but notice a little bit of a drop-off to the north of the Twin Cities, 73 right now in Brainerd 
northern Minnesota. There's actually a weak cold front that's pushing through Minnesota and Wisconsin. More importantly, the dew point temperatures, which are in the upper 60s here in the middle 60s, as far north as northwestern Wisconsin, drop off very rapidly into the 50s and 40s over northwestern uh, Minnesota. So that's another sign that that cold front will be pushing southeastward. And as it does so, it could trigger some thunderstorms. Now, right now, winds are pretty light. They're generally uh, out of uh, actually just kind of variable here, but they do shift to a more northwesterly direction over northern Minnesota. So once that cold front starts pushing into the, the more humid air across central and southern Wisconsin, there could be a round of thunderstorms, mainly late evening into the early overnight hours. Storm Prediction Center has a slight risk of severe thunderstorms north and west of Madison and a marginal risk to the south and east. Hail and gusty winds would be the main threats, but it's not a, a foregone conclusion that everybody's going to see thunderstorms, and it's even slightly possible that we don't get uh, much in the way of uh, storm activity to develop at all. You can see on Doppler track right now, there's really not much out there. So we're still waiting for the storms to get going. The farther that cold front gets before it uh, before the storms develop, the lesser the chances that we'll see severe weather here. Now, as we take a look at uh, southern Wisconsin, things very quiet right now. It's cloudy, but uh, again, the uh, no rain right now in the uh, foreseeable uh, couple of hours. High temperatures, though, definitely trending up. Should be around 80 the next couple of days, mid 80s on Friday, and then lower 90s over the weekend. Live view from the Queen Bee Radio Skycam at Platteville. Lots of clouds there. Again, no rain in southern Wisconsin right now. Edgewater Skycam in downtown Madison. Pretty cloudy. Looks gloomy, but it is very humid out there. As we check out the almanac for today, the humidity kept our low temperature up at 65 degrees. That's 10 degrees above average. The high temperature of 78, only one degree above normal. And right now we're at 75. The air is calm. But look at that dew point temperature, 68 degrees relative humidity 79 percent it is very humid out there jet stream coming in from the west that will trigger a couple of thunderstorms again as that cold front comes through but notice the western part of the country pretty free of clouds so once uh, that cold front comes through we're looking for a couple of days of quiet weather the next weather system in toward the gulf of alaska and into uh, far western canada uh, will stay to our north over the weekend and just keep our temperatures hot and that weak cold front to our northwest actually even falls apart to the south temperatures mainly in the 70s and 80s here where there's sun shining uh, down to the south temperatures upper 80s to around 90 degrees so 60 for the overnight low temperature it'll be cloudy and mild a period of showers and thunderstorms probably somewhere around midnight give or take a couple of hours but tomorrow will be sunny and warm less humid though high temperature dropping back uh, will be at 80 degrees on future track you can see the uh, th threat for a little line of thunderstorms to move through skies will clear out by tomorrow morning and then look for sunny skies tomorrow with high temperatures around 80 tomorrow night partly cloudy skies low temperatures dropping into the upper 50s and then partly sunny skies on Thursday high temperatures lower 80s but as we take a look at the 7 to 10 day forecast you'll see those temperatures right back up especially as we head uh, toward the weekend look for high temperatures to be in the uh, middle 80s on Friday with some thunderstorms on a warm front and then around 90 for the weekend and middle 80s from Monday of next week, maybe lower 80s next week with a chance for thunderstorms about Thursday. As we take a look at first alert traffic, we've seen some delays on the Beltline in both directions. Eastbound, they begin around almost to Monona Drive and go back west of Verona Road. Uh, westbound, the delays more in the uh, Seminole Highway to uh, Park Street uh, range. Going eastbound, a 24-minute commute from University Avenue to the interstate. Westbound on the Beltline, a 17-minute commute. And heading out of town, about 28 minutes down to Janesville on Highway on uh, I-3990. 21 minutes to Sauk City on US-12. And 17 minutes to Sun Prairie on East Washington Avenue, US-151. That's your first alert traffic. Now, see, when I talk about humidity, right now when it's not that crazy hot, humidity doesn't bother me. But... By the weekend. Come on out here. It's, 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 I mean, it's, I, I, I'm, it's sticky it's out here. I'm not getting, it up, can all I'm not getting in the middle of this. <sighs> Gary and his numbers. We'll see. The weekend, <laughs> we're going to feel that humidity. Thank you, Gary. <laughs> sure. Still ahead at five, a new round of crash test results for mid-sized SUVs. It's been released, and we'll tell you those outcomes. That's next at five. Stay with us.
The Insurance Institute for Highway Safety is out with a new round of crash tests. This time, the Insurance Research Group focused on the safety of passengers riding in mid-size SUVs. Chris Martinez has the results. Of the eight mid-size SUVs tested, six earned either good or acceptable ratings from the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety when it comes to the safety of front seat passengers in a crash. The testing focused on small overlap crashes, which happen when the front corner of the SUV strikes an object like another vehicle or a tree. The 2019 Kia Sorento, the 2018 Volkswagen Atlas, and the 2018 GMC Acadia performed the best and received good ratings overall. The main reason a vehicle gets a good rating is because the structure, in particular the safety cage, the parts of the vehicle structure that surround the occupants, stays intact. The 2018 Toyota Highlander, 2018 Nissan Pathfinder, and 2018 Honda Pilot earned acceptable marks, while the worst performing SUVs were the Ford Explorer and and Jeep Grand Cherokee. Both received poor overall ratings, with researchers noting a range of issues, including structural collapse, a non-deploying side airbag, and hard hits to the test dummy's head. We understand from both uh, Fiat Chrysler, who make the Jeep, and Ford that they are planning improvements uh, when they redesign these models. Of the newly rated SUVs, the 2019 Kia Sorento is the only one to earn the Institute's highest award, Top Safety Pick with good or acceptable ratings in this and other IIHS crashworthiness tests. Chris Martinez, CBS News, Los Angeles. The SUVs were crash tested at a speed of 40 miles an hour. Researchers at the IAHS say overall, people are much better protected in today's cars, SUVs, and passenger trucks than ever before. Stay with us. We'll have another check of your very humid forecast when we return.
So the humidity's moving out. Hum humidity. <laughs> Just go outside, I'm telling you. I know, I, I, agree you. I agree with you. I agree with you. Pretty Don't humid out there, but him. so far, no thunderstorms. <laughs> Take a look at uh, Doppler track, waiting to see if something will develop, but the Storm Prediction Center does have a slight risk of severe thunderstorms uh, for tonight. But uh, temperatures right now, mid-70s. There's the dew points, upper 60s to oh, lower yeah, that's 70s. Humid. That, oh, is that is very Good humid. Heavens. Thank you for agreeing with me. Uh, shower and thunderstorm chances end late tonight. Dry for uh, tomorrow and Thursday. Heat and humidity really build for the weekend and some thunderstorm chances yeah. next week as well. And that's that's when you're going to feel it. We'll see you at 6, folks. Thanks for watching.